So this evening, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Theda Scotchpool. Theda Scotchpool is the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard University, where she has served as Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Science, Sciences and as Director of the Center for American Political Studies. Her books and articles have been widely cited in political science literature and have won numerous awards. Recent titles include The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism and Reaching for a New Deal, Ambitious Governance, Economic Meltdown, and the Polarized Politics in Obama's First Two Years. Professor Scotchpool's research focuses on U.S. social policy and civic engagement in American democracy, including changes since the 1960s, with new work on the development of U.S. higher education and the transformations of federal policies under President Obama. Her latest book, Obama and America's Political Future, explores the triumphs and setbacks of the Obama presidency thus far, from his new New Deal to the ascendance of the Tea Party. We're very pleased to bring her back to Harvard Bookstore tonight. Please join me in welcoming Theda Scotchpool. Well, thank you very much, and it's, it's a great pleasure to be here at this very important bookstore. I think we all agree it's a treasure in the community. Uh, it's obviously fall, and it's pretty clear that the heart of a pivotal election campaign is kicking off. Uh, and as I will argue in this, these remarks, it's one of the most important elections in American history that we're headed into. Now let me start by reminding us what it was like four years ago. Um, the euphoria that greeted the election of Barack Obama, that, uh, that huge crowd in uh, Grant Park. Uh, within days, uh, the pundits were declaring that the Republican Party was dead and that we were on the verge of a new New Deal. There was a very striking cover of, uh, I, I believe it's Time Magazine, that uh, showed Obama uh, riding FDR style in an open convertible with a cigarette dangling out of his grinning mouth. And the cover story talked about how a president elected with young voters, with minority voters, with a rising American electorate in the midst of a crisis, with two thirds of Americans initially pleased about the victory. Uh, that he had the chance to uh, change the course of uh, our government. This was a president who had campaigned for office by talking about taxing the rich, which hadn't happened in the Democratic Party for a couple of decades, who had talked about creating an economy that is built from the bottom up and was quite explicit about his desire to change direction in a whole series of domestic policy areas and of course, his pledge to end the war in Iraq. Uh, he did also pledge to expand the war in Afghanistan. And some people, I think, like to forget that he made that pledge. But uh, this was a president who obviously is ambitious, backed by apparently transformational um, coalition, uh, coming into office at a moment of profound economic crisis, which a lot of political scientists and observers think is a moment when Americans are more open to government doing things where you can change directions. So that was four years ago. And here we are four years later, and it's been now several years where many of those who had the highest hopes in Obama have been engaged in endless griping about how little he has accomplished and how disappointing he's been. Uh, and that's not even to bring into the picture uh, the fact that we still have 8% unemployment and uh, a middle class and, and, and poor people who are, have been hammered and who have not in any way fully recovered uh, from the, the greatest economic downturn in American history since the 1930s, after the 1930s. Uh, we also have a radicalized Republican Party, a truly extreme, that is uh, geared up if it can take all three branches in the November election, the presidency and both houses of Congress, to reverse not just 
Obama's accomplishments, but probably the Great Society and the New Deal as well. Uh, they certainly are pledged to do so, and uh, uh, there's a lot of momentum behind those pledges. So my book is about what happened. First of all, um, what happened to the New New Deal? And it may surprise uh, all, all of you who dig into the full argument that I actually think a lot of policy change accomplished was accomplished uh, under the first two years, uh, particularly, of Obama's presidency. It's not very often that a president of one party comes to power with backing from substantial majorities in the House and the Senate at the same time. It's a kind of rare convergence that happens not very often. And uh, even though it wasn't as much of a majority as many people imagined in 2008, in fact, there was a veto-proof, I mean, a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate only for five months uh, after Al Franken finally arrived and, and, and before um, <clears throat> Scott Brown arrived, uh, there nevertheless was a lot of possibility to do things in those first two years. And, um, a lot did happen, at least by political science standards, and I'm a political scientist, so we're very aware of how difficult it is to assemble congressional majorities, how protracted the effort to pass things may be, uh, and yet a major American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was uh, quickly passed that may not have been big enough, but it certainly made a huge difference in keeping the country from falling into another 1930s style depression. And there were many things included in those initial budget um, measures that were passed by the Democrats that planted seeds for investments in clean energy, for new approaches in higher education, for health care reform. Health care reform passed too, finally. Finally squeaked through after 15 months. And I've written a book about that health care reform, and I think it's a transformational law. Uh, people can be disappointed about the public option not being there, but this is one of the most redistributive laws that has ever passed in the United States in that it taxes business and the rich to, to expand health care coverage to low- and middle-income people who don't have it, and it puts in place a set of regulations for private insurance companies that will make them operate more like the NFL and less like Major League Baseball. Uh, so it was quite an accomplishment to get it passed and another big accomplishment for it to be upheld by the Supreme Court. And that's not to count other things like new financial regulations, a transformation of college loans that went unnoticed because it was kind of packaged with the health care in the final thing, but the banks were taken out as intermediaries in the implementation of student loans so that more money could be spent directly on college students. Um, in areas where it was impossible to pass legislation like immigration reform, labor law reform, uh, the Obama administration has done quite a lot administratively, including through the EPA. So if we looked just at the amount of policy change that occurred legislatively and in regulatory terms, uh, we would say that there was at least a three-quarters New Deal here um, in the first couple of years. But of course, what didn't come with the New Deal was what is supposed to come with a New Deal, and that is a supportive political realignment. Uh, the whole idea of a New Deal is that the government changes direction in policy and that both flows from and reinforces the political coalition that enabled it, creating a sense of permanent change. That's how we think about the 1930s, at least we do in retrospect. At the time, I don't think it was so obvious that all this was happening and it certainly didn't happen easily. But by any standards, uh, the political backlash against Obama was fast. And uh, he, he started facing uh, severe opposition. The Democrats uh, experienced uh, setbacks in the 2010 elections that were just as historic as the 2008 election was in the other direction. 
So why did it turn out that way? Well, I'm not going to walk you through it all, but let me just hit a few highlights of the argument. And it's partly developed by comparing this period to the first New Deal, not to point to parallels, but to point to some of the things that are different between the two periods that help clarify uh, these different political trajectories. Um, Franklin Roosevelt came to power in an ec a massive economic downturn. But he came to power, to Washington, at the trough after several years of collapse with very high levels of unemployment at a time when Democrats and Republicans alike in Congress were prepared to pass any bill he sent without even reading it. And Republicans too. In the, it didn't last, but for a while. Obama, by contrast, ended up holding hands with Herbert Hoover because he came to the presidency just as an economic meltdown was starting, induced by a financial crisis that he felt he had to step in to try to limit. And of course he did have to. So he cooperated with outgoing President George W. Bush uh, on the bailout legislation and then took steps to prevent the collapse of the real economy and the growth of unemployment from going as deeply as it might. What that meant was that he didn't have the clear understanding in the American public that he was taking emergency actions that absolutely had to be take, taken, and he was also open to being targeted by Republican opponents who knew that the economic downturn was going to get steadily worse during the first two years of Obama's presidency and that he would face re-election this year probably without anything like a full uh, uh, recovery of employment. So that's the first big difference. Um, Obama uh, faced um, the need to stave off an, a financial collapse. He ended up working with economic advisors who were closely tied to Wall Street and that also stood in the way of delivering clear policy messages to Americans about job recovery. The second point would be that partisanship and ideology really do real align much more closely in this era than they did in the 30s. There were conservatives in the 30s too, and they became sworn enemies of the New Deal, but they were in both political parties. In our era, you know, there certainly are some moderate foot-dragging Democrats, but conservatives are mainly in the Republican Party, and so they had all the levers that a party has in Congress. And they had a decision to make when Obama was inaugurated about whether they would cooperate with him on national emergency recovery measures, and they chose not to do so. Partly because they lost so badly in 2008 that their mass base was very conservative, concentrated in Appalachia and the South, and being whipped constantly by Rush Limbaugh and other extreme voices in the media into a state of fear and anger about Obama. But also out of cold calculus, I think it's clear that John Boehner and, John, and uh, Mitch McConnell made a decision that if they just said no and could keep their troops in line, they would be in a better position to pick up the pieces politically as Obama fell short of the hopes that people had for him. The next thing I'll just mention briefly is the structure of the media. Many people have been frustrated with Obama's ability, inability to, to communicate clearly what he has been doing as president, and I think there are some real failures on his part. I don't think he did a good job of explaining his economic recovery policies. Uh, and mobilizing pu public support for more, for either doing more or for at least tr visibly trying to do more. Uh, but at the same time, he faces a structure of the media that I would characterize as a combination of 19th century American media. People will remember that in the 19th century, media were all partisan aligned. And so now we have a big hunk of the 19th century in the form of Fox News and other right-wing media that are openly um, aligned 
with uh, conservatives and Republicans. And then we have the rest of the media under economic stress, very fragmented, and uh, trying to sort of keep up with Fox. This does not create a good situation for a president trying to deal with a crisis to communicate a clear message because his opponents can hammer quite regularly uh, and reach the older white part of the electorate, which still watches television, uh, and yet he can't get much of a message in any unified way across in the rest of the media. And then the final thing I would point to that's very important in thinking about the difference from the 1930s makes a big difference if you're trying to expand the role of the federal government in domestic life for the first time, create social security, create labor laws. Uh, they're visible, they're new, they're not, they don't have to hack their way through a lot of previous policies, many of which kind of collapsed or fell by the wayside in the, in the Great Depression. That was FDR's situation. Obama's situation, coming to office as a reformist Democrat in the early 21st century, was that he needed to redirect an already very large domestic federal government with large amounts of expenditures, a tight budget situation, many policies in the forms of regulations that affect every industry and every community, and tax credits, a lot of things being done by tax credits that most ordinary citizens do not see. Uh, my colleague and friend Suzanne Mettler at Cornell University has written about the fact that a lot of what government does for ordinary citizens is invisible to them now. And Obama wanted to change the direction of all of that. He wanted to ask a little more from the rich he wanted to pull back on some of the subsidies and regulatory advantages given to the most powerful players and squeeze out some resources to do more for college loans, health care for low and middle income people, um, economic opportunity in various ways. The people whose toes he was stepping on, the interests whose toes his proposal stepped on, instantly knew what they would lose if he made any progress at all in any of these policy spheres, but the potential winners, if he should succeed, didn't see what they would gain. And that remains true even in this election. Uh, you know, you wonder, how can this fairly mild-mannered guy who looks timid to many on the left arouse such fury among conservatives. Well, they know the stakes. They understand what he's asking, what he's trying to do, whereas the potential winners, particularly those who don't follow politics closely, may not understand. Now, I'm not going to talk very much about the Tea Party part of the book, but let me just say that um, all the things I've said would have made it hard enough. If, if it had just been a matter of all of the vested interests in the health care system, understanding what they would lose if affordable care passed, whereas the people who are going to get the health insurance after 2014 don't really understand yet what they're going to get, uh, that would have been tough enough. But of course, on top of all of this, uh, a a, a pincer operation broke out on the rightward edge of the Republican Party. And I say a pincer operation because the Tea Party's not just one thing. It's grassroots activism, which is very genuine. It's not manufactured. It's not an illusion created by the Koch brothers. <laughs> Older, white, conservative-minded people, very angry, very fearful, very worked up about immigration, above all. Uh, and very concerned that this president would redirect resources from their, ask them to pay taxes, redirect resources from programs they cherish, which happen to include Medicare and Social Security, which many of them are on, and give them to those undeserving moochers or freeloaders. That's, those are the terms that Vanessa Williamson and I heard when we interviewed <coughs> grassroots Tea Partiers. So that's the grassroots part, and that 
outbreak in 2009, 2010 resulted in about 900 local tea parties around the country, which um, ended up putting a lot, capturing a lot of media attention and putting a lot of, of pressure on the Republican Party to never compromise and to uh, stay firm in opposition to Democrats and Obama. But on top of that, you have billionaire funders who have been proposing for many years ultra-free market policies, less taxes on the rich, removal of all regulations, blocking any environmental regulations, undoing the APA, their, and privatizing Social Security and Medicare. Their policies have, are not new. They've been pursuing them for decades, but they've taken advantage of the Tea Party fervor at the bottom to put additional pressure on Republican candidates and office holders, substituting more conservative Republicans for, for very conservative Republicans, or frightening Republicans who remain in office that they must never compromise. So that's why we got in 2010, not just what any political scientist would have predicted, which is a, a pushback toward the Republicans. We were gonna get that, and we were gonna get more of it in an economic downturn that was stubborn. But we got even more than that because of this fervor and this funding in the Tea Party eruption and the Republicans who were elected uh, are the most conservative, according to political science, quantitative measures in 50 years. And we saw in the Republican primaries over the last year uh, a competition to see who could be more ruthless about immigrants. Uh, uh, Romney won the competition, remember? We, people thought he was a moderate. He finished off Rick Perry by saying uh, it was outrageous that Rick Perry wanted to give college uh, benefits to uh, the children of undocumented in Texas. That was the way that Perry, people thought it was because Perry couldn't put a sentence together. That really wasn't decisive. It was that, that he w wanted to do something for immigrants. And then we've seen Romney sign on to the elite Tea Party uh, program by appointing the darling of the Koch brothers, whose career was sponsored by the Koch brothers, Paul Ryan, as his vice president. So that brings me to the last point I'm going to make. This turns out to be a really high-stakes election. It's not just a question of whether the people who got behind Barack Obama in 2008 are going to maintain enough enthusiasm to go to the polls, and that's always a worry where young people are concerned. They often don't vote. Uh, whether they're going to be kept from voting by the voter suppression efforts, which are systematic around the country, targeted at poor and African American and Latino people. It's also a question of, uh, you know, whether the uh, middle, such as it is, and there isn't much of one, will, um, how they'll come down on this question of whether to support a president who has not delivered the full economic recovery that people wanted and hoped for, um, or whether uh, they will accept the, the, the version of themselves that Republicans are presenting in in television ads that will be, uh, uh, there was about a billion dollars more of them to come uh, in the next two months. And I really don't know how this is gonna turn out, but I do know for sure that the direction of the United States will be very different according to one of two possible outcomes, and I'll conclude on that point. If the radicalized, the truly radicalized Republican Party that is in the field now, wins the presidency in both houses of Congress by even a vote or two. They will dismantle most of American social policy in three months. Because they don't kid around. And the people who are the policy part of this operation understand this is their last chance given the demographic and political changes that are happening in the United States. 
If Obama wins re-election, well, his Affordable Care Act will survive. And that will become quite popular with Americans. It's already all the specifics are quite popular, except for the mandate. Uh, even in the first four years, most of the implementation of it is automatic after that. Um, and perhaps Obama will be able to strike deals with Republicans, depending on how well they do in the House and the Senate, on matters of taxes, to include some tax adjustments for the wealthy in a budget deal. Perhaps there'll be a deal on immigration, because there will be forces in the Republican Party that will not want to face the electorate again with a completely negative approach to Latinos. But it won't be that new New Deal that everybody thought was possible. It's not going to be some burst of uh, light or darkness, depending on your perspective. Uh, it'll be a grind. But if Obama's reelected, he will be able to reinforce the transformations, which are a lot more than people think they are, that were accomplished in the first two years. And the country will move within four years to a new kind of politics that will probably be based on somewhat more moderation. Um, but it's a big election. It's probably comparable in its importance to 1860 and 1896 uh, and 1932. Maybe more important than 1932. So that's my argument. And I'd be happy to take comments or questions uh, for a while. OK, so the question is, if Obama had put more into the stimulus package, would that have changed things? A anything would have changed things that could have promoted more of a jobs recovery over the first two years. But do I see a reason why he didn't? Yes, I do. I'm a political scientist, and political scientists pay attention to Congress. And I didn't talk very much about that, but I'll say just a little bit more. Even though there were substantial Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate, um, no move was made, and in retrospect, perhaps it should have been, to break the hold of the filibuster rule in the Senate. Um, so there was always the problem of getting the number of votes you needed to get something through there. And remember, they had to buy off um, Susan Collins and uh, Olympia Snow. And at that time, Arlen Specter was still a Republican. And the price was to cut back on a lot of the spending and to put in tax cuts, which are less stimulative. And the decision of Republican leaders to oppose this president from the day of his inauguration, and we now know that it was from the day of his inauguration, meant that they barely got it through the House. And the thing to keep in mind is that it's not just Republican votes against. It's the effect that Republican votes have on moderate Democrats. When Republicans go all out in opposition, particularly to spending measures, that will increase the deficit. That frightens uh, quite a few Democrats from um, the heartland of the country in areas that are not like Cambridge, Massachusetts. So um, I think they got pretty much what they could get through. And my argument is not so much what they got in the stimulus as the failure to explain what they were trying to do and to follow up on that. And I have much more reservation about the turn a year later to deficit politics. I think that was a clearly mistaken move. Uh, it was at the stage where Obama and some of his advisors still thought that if they appeared moderate on that, they might get cooperation from some Republicans. Ha! Um, but they weren't the only ones in Washington deluding themselves. There are large numbers of people in Washington who delude themselves um, all the time. I'm studying the climate change effort now, and I can tell you that the key players in the climate change effort were deluding themselves every step of the way because they thought they were going to get Republican votes. And I don't, I don't think a lot of them understood what was happening at the edge of the Republican Party. Uh, so, yeah. 
Yeah, I think what I'm going to say here is that I was one of the people who believed, as I watched the 2008 election, that Americans had moved much further beyond race than I ever expected would be possible. I was very impressed in the 2007-2008 cycle uh, at um, how little it seemed to matter. Now, it certainly mattered on the edges. And my sister lives in West Virginia. I can tell you that it matters plenty down there. Uh, but it also helped him. I um, mean, he got a boost uh, from, from both uh, the black electorate and from whites who were proud of this. But I think that the color of his skin in interaction with his foreign father, which may be even more important, the fact that he's a co former college professor, which in conservative America is a very negative thing, um, all of those things combined with the fact that he's a Democrat have made it easy to demonize him and to arouse popular fears among the older white grassroots people. And there's no question that racial appeals are being openly used in this election. I mean, the, the, the ads suggesting that he was uh, relaxing the work requirement in welfare, which are just outright lies. I mean, they're just outright lies. Um, sometimes there's a kernel of truth in these things, but there's no kernel here. Um, that was deliberate attempt to arouse racial animus and fear and direct it downward. So I would say race has mattered more since he was elected president than it mattered in the process of electing him president. But I do want to finally say that conservatives, and those of you who read my Tea Party book will know that I treat them with respect. I'm not one of them, but I, I engage in no um, disparagement of the Tea Party people that I met and talked with. They are our fellow citizens, and some may be here. So uh, it's perfectly fine to be a conservative. Um, but conservatives have not been willing to accept the legitimacy of Democratic presidents elected with Democrats in Congress behind them. And we know because when it happened with Bill Clinton, they went after him. I mean, he was portrayed as a murderer. Um, he was portrayed as morally derelict, and there was material to work with there. Uh, and I think what's fair to say is that modern conservatives are so fearful and so willing, unwilling to accept the legitimacy of a Democratic president backed by enough power in Congress to actually do something with uh, Democratic policymaking that they try to delegitimate them. And in the, especially in the Fox News era, they have a lot of, of capacity to do that. And they use the material at hand. And in the case of Obama, it's the foreign father and the um, probably allusions to the color of his skin. But it's the whole package. It's not just race. And I never heard anything said about his moral behavior. I mean, his family behavior is not used. It was used against Clinton, but not used against Obama. Now, I don't expect uh, Republicans to carry through on the promises to radically cut uh, everything about the federal budget. They'll ramp up military spending, and they, won't, they will take measures not to completely deflate employment. Um, but I do think they'll restructure social, uh, Medicare, and I, I do think they'll try to get rid of or eviscerate the Affordable Care Act, and particularly the expansions of subsidies and Medicaid to low-income people. Um, so then the question is how much of a backlash there'll be to that and uh, how organized it will be. I mean, we saw in Wisconsin what happens when uh, determined Republicans come to power. One of the things they do is they immediately go for the organizational capacities of their opponents. Um, and uh, that's been true since 2010 in the voter suppression efforts, which are uh, unremitting in states completely controlled by r Republicans and not even hidden, particularly, uh, efforts to make it harder to vote. Uh, breaking up the public sector unions, which are what are left of the ab ability to organize and to fund uh, the opposition. So I would expect a lot more of that. 
Um, and then the question will be whether there's any fight, fight back. It's not a popularity contest. I think you're going to find, I'll tell you that I'm a kind of social scientist who doesn't believe it's all a matter of what people say in the polls. The polls matter, but organized capacity matters more. And so um, you, you need popular support. The fact that Americans love Medicare would be a resource to use in fighting back, but it's not automatic. And we're seeing in this election that people can be confused about what it means to support Medicare. Um, it's not hard to do. So I don't know what will happen. There will certainly be an opportunity for things to turn back, but a lot will depend on whether uh, a Republican regime is identified with economic growth and whether uh, there's any organized capacity to, to push back. If the Republicans lose to Obama this time, what's to prevent them from biding their time for another four years and having another go? Of course they will. And uh, at the presidential level, they'll have a very good shot, although if the Democrats nominate Hillary Clinton, I think they're going to be in very good shape in four years. Um, the, th the reason that I say it's the last shot is that a lot of the majority, the possibility to getting to a majority is eroding fast as demographic changes play out. Four years from now, many of the Tea Partiers will not be with us. And I, I'm not happy about that. I liked the people I met. Uh, and I'm their same age, so I may not be here either. But uh, it, it's just the reality. Uh, there won't, and they're not recruiting younger, younger ones very much. There are some young libertarians, but they're not the same. So the demographics are moving against Republicans, but demography is not simply destiny. It also interacts with policy. And Here's the other reason I think it'll be too late in four years, and I think they think so too. I think that's why they're so mobilized. Um, the Affordable Care Act is not just a series of economic redistributions and new rules of the game for insurance companies. Those are important. But it's also the ability to convince working-aged lower and lower middle income Americans that government can do something that matters for them. We've gone a very long time in this country without most working aged people thinking the government is on their side. For good reason. You know, sure, I think families are glad if grandma and grandpa have something, and that is a family policy. Social Security and Medicare are family policies. But many working aged men in particular think, you know, what are they doing for me? They're just taxing me. And maybe they believe this idea that the money's being given to the poor. Or you're just on your own. So the Affordable Care Act is politically threatening to the Republicans and the right because for the reason that Bill Kristol laid out in a memo in 1994 when he mobilized the troops against Clinton's health plan. He said if if the middle class in this country becomes convinced that government can help, that it can matter, uh, then we won't go back. Um, so getting rid of Social Security and Medicare, that's important. But boy, blocking this one is a big, big in the eyes. And I, I find it amazing when I look out at the fight over affordable care. Everybody on the left is saying, oh, it doesn't have the public option. It's not worth anything. And everybody in the middle and the right is, sees it as Armageddon. Uh, and I think the right's right on that. I mean, if, if the demography plays out for another four years and that law is carried through, it's going to change the political landscape going forward from there. It doesn't mean Republicans will never win. Not at all. It just means they won't be the same Republicans as the ones that are in the field right now. And it, the failure of the labor bill and whether that was the, you're, I guess you're referring to the legislation the unions wanted to, to, to make it easier to organize, to hold elections. And that was, of course, uh, also a fateful shortfall. Now, they didn't ever try that very hard, and that's because they couldn't get the votes they needed from Democrats. Um, you know, the other thing that could change, and 
I'm just thinking on my feet here, and I'll say that this could change things in completely unexpected directions. And it might happen if the Republicans win in November. And that's getting rid of the filibuster in the Senate. If that happens, it's going to change American politics going forward. Um, and it might change it initially for Republicans and make it, I don't expect them to let anything like the filibuster stand in the way. I mean, they're just budget rules gone. I mean, you know, they, they just won't let them stand in the way of carrying through. But once those things are gone, then they're gone when Democrats are there too, assuming that Democrats come back. So um, that could make a big difference, and it would have made a big difference if, it, if the filibuster had either been eliminated or had been uh, trimmed back uh, in 2009 and 2010. Uh, it's looking okay for the Democrats to have a shot, but um, as I think all of us know, uh, there are 10 seats at risk for Republicans, 23 for Democrats, so it's very, very difficult. And, if Elizabeth Warren cannot reverse the dynamic, which is not in her favor at all right now in Massachusetts, uh, that could, could make it hard for the Democrats to hold the Senate. Um, well, that's where the filibuster is going to be pretty important. Now, quite a few of the things Republicans want to change, they will define as budget and tax measures that can be done with 51 votes under the so-called reconciliation procedure. Uh, exactly how they're going to handle that, given that many of the things they want to do increase the deficit and you're not supposed to, I'm not sure, but I'm sure they'll handle that problem. Um, so it may not make as much difference as we might think if it's 58, Dem if, if, it's, if, 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 if it's two Democrats short of 50, 48. Um, but of course it matters. I mean, it does matter, and it even matters in the House. The House is a majoritarian institution, but if the Democrats in the House pick up 15 to 20 seats of the 25 they need, and they may, I think this Medicare thing is big at the, in the House, even more than at the presidential level. Um, the, the fact that Paul Ryan's uh, plan can be explained to constituents by Democratic candidates for the House where they have more face-to-face -face contact. I actually think that could matter. And if the Democrats come very close in the House, it may be harder for, uh, for the Republican leadership to maintain uh, discipline. But they're, they're, they're good at it. They are. And the Tea Party forces are not going to disappear. We went, we went back and took a look at the 900 websites to see how many were still active a year later, and at least two-thirds are. And that's really pretty remarkable um, for a movement at the grassroots. So those local Tea Partiers are not on television now because uh, people understand on the right understand that they're not popular, so they're not putting the cameras on them. But they're there pushing Republican office holders from below. And they're very assiduous citizens. They do their homework, and they, they're, they're putting on the pressure. You know, I think that uh, it's important to understand that the Obama administration tried to close Guantanamo, and it was Congress that blocked that. And, you know, one of the things that's very striking to me in studying American politics is that so many people on the left think the president is omnipotent. Uh, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in with, you know, fellow professors going through the details of all the policies, everybody knows them, uh, and then saying, well, if, if Obama would just give a speech about this, um, that would change things. Well, I can tell you that it wouldn't change things in Congress. I mean, he couldn't even get Democrats to go along with closing Guantanamo, let alone Republicans. On Afghanistan, I'm puzzled about that criticism on the left simply because I remember Obama campaigning in 2007 and 2008 saying, I'm going to s close down the Iraq war and ramp up the Afghanistan war. And that's exactly what he did. And, you know, I, my, the book here is not mainly about foreign policy, but just let me say that one of the things that's very difficult for a Democratic president is to develop a, a, a reputation for strength in foreign policy. And Obama had everything going against him on that. It was an area of enormous vulnerability. 
And if he had not been able to, you know, he brought in a moderate Republican defense secretary. He put Hillary Clinton into, he, he did a whole series of moves to make it possible to recreate bipartisan foreign policy the way it would have been if the Republican Party were still what it was 15 years ago. Uh, and he did, he used that to shut down a war without a signing ceremony on an aircraft carrier. Well, that's hard. And of course, he was dead serious all along about going after uh, uh, Osama bin Laden, and he bagged the guy. So that's very important for keeping him even in this election, if he hadn't been able to do those things. And he's already set in motion the ratcheting down of the Afghan war. And believe me, if the Republicans win, the, the Afghan war is not going to be completely ratcheted down. And probably there will be another war uh, started shortly into that. So I, mean, I don't understand the hyper-left critique of Obama. I don't think he failed to deliver on anything he promised except closing down Guantanamo. And that was not his doing. That was Congress. Well, you'll see if you read the book that um, I do criticize him for failing to have a clear message on his economic recovery strategy. I mean, if you look, he didn't speak to Americans for the first year or so about what he was trying to do. And I do think that was a serious mistake, and apparently Obama has accepted that critique, which quite a few people have made. I'm not saying he even knows I exist, so I mean, that's not... I'm not taking credit, but I do think there's something to be said about his failure to explain an economic recovery strategy in a way that was clearly understandable so that people could understand what fell short, what Congress was blocking, what he was trying to do. He started doing that last fall after the, after the, uh, you know, the debt ceiling meltdown was over. He, he started a narrative which has been much more effective since then. Um, but I don't go all the way with the Drew Weston thing. I think you can over-psychologize these things. And as you can see, my analysis is much more looking at the organized forces and the institutional context in which he's operating. And when I read Weston's work, I don't even see Congress mentioned. And that's just, you can't, this is not a parliamentary system. I mean, presidents can speak, give speeches, they can make proposals, but it, it depends on what Congress is prepared to do. And everybody was very frustrated with the 15 months of sausage making that it took to get the Affordable Care Act through, but let's face it, in the end, they, he got it through. Now, I think Nancy Pelosi was just as responsible, but um, that was, an, uh, that was a 50-year a achievement to get that law through passed, and remember, it just barely made it. Uh, so uh, Congress is a big, big obstacle, uh, and that means congressional Democrats as well as congressional Republicans. Why is that? Yep. Well, I'm very proud of the media section in this book. It's not very long, but it is an analysis of how you can understand American media now. And of course, given that it's scotch pole, it's a more organizational analysis. And I think the thing to understand is that you've got this guerrilla of Fox News and associated right-wing media that can sh deliver a consistent message to about a third. I mean, when we interviewed grassroots Tea Partiers, that's all they watched was Fox News, six to eight hours a day. Uh, so, you know, I mean, there's no question about getting a consistent message across there. And then the rest of the media is a sort of fragmented set of outlets. No, young people don't really watch television, they, except for Colbert and 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 uh, and and John Stewart, who I, is America's finest newsman, in my opinion, I mean, I think he does a very good job of laying out what's going on, and he did deal with the filibuster to some degree. But for the most part, the media don't look at process stories. They want to find ways to appear balanced in a very superficial sense, so they'll say it's both sides. And I think it's only in the last year that it's finally gotten through. Um, partly because of the media and the reporters' incentives outside of Fox to appear balanced, 
but also partly because the DC punditry finally took a step when that book by Ornstein and Mann was published that said it's the Republicans, not polarization. It's asymmetric. It's one-sided polarization. That suddenly gave the press corps in Washington and the political reporters some permission to begin to talk about extremism in the Republican Party. But they arrived at, the par at that very late, and they don't think things like the filibuster are sexy. So they don't just get up there and say, this is being used to an unprecedented degree now. Uh, and most Americans don't know that. And why would they know that? I mean, nobody tells them. And um, so there's a lot to be frustrated with about the media, but I think you can understand it in terms of the incentives that exist for reporters and uh, the kind of mindset that exists in Washington, DC, which is only lately beginning to change a little bit. Well, we're certainly having a class struggle. I mean, uh, you know, and uh, for the first time in a long time, uh, our politicians are talking about that. Uh, that's what's really pretty remarkable over the last four years, is that there's discussion of inequality and discussion of um, um, tax policy and who should pay and who shouldn't. And, Obama has been doing that even since, you know, in his own fairly mild way from the first time he ran, and now there's nothing mild about it. Now, the only thing is that the class struggle pits um, very wealthy people against everybody else. Uh, and I'm not saying that because I'm some kind of Occupy Wall Street person. I'm actually not. Uh, I'm pretty critical of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, but I the facts of the matter are that inequality in the United States has just galloped forward in the last several decades. And the part of it that, that's most striking is the way the super duper rich have pulled away from everybody else. And that they want to use their advantages to modify the political process still further to, to claim even more. Um, a lot of the wealth is politically channeled to people at the very top. And certainly the, it, the attempt to get out of the tax burden of paying for Medicare and Social Security for ordinary middle class people, that's, that's what a lot of right wing politics is about, to make sure that they don't have to pay anything to, for, the, for old people uh, in the middle and, and working class. So this is a class struggle. I think it's being fairly clearly articulated, but it's a class struggle between the rich and everybody else, and the big question is whether middle class Americans will once again accept the idea that the, their enemies are the poor, who are getting too much. And the young are kind of added in here too. I mean, a lot of people think the young are moochers. Uh, or whether they will this time uh, think that maybe electing a Bain executive is not the way to go uh, for the middle class. And it's frankly, for ordinary Americans, it's a tough choice. Because think about it from the point of view of an ordinary, let's take a middle class, white collar person in the middle of the country. Um, they know the economy's not going so well, certainly not going as well as it is here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're living in a very privileged area. And their instinct is, to throw the bums out and give the other bums a chance. And that's not irrational, really, if the bums are Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh, but if the bums have changed, then it might be. So I think a lot of ordinary citizens are only now grappling with this. They are not thinking it through in very, very highly ideological terms. But they're thinking about this and how they decide in places like Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, Michigan. That's where I grew up. That will determine this election. And I think a lot of times people in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or in university communities look down on that and say, oh, you know, they're not, not paying attention. They're, not, they're being bamboozled. Actually, I think for ordinary Americans, first of all, politics is not what you're spending your time on. Uh, 
It's not very pleasant. You can't understand it very well. Uh, you're being bombarded in these states by these ads that are very simplistic on both sides to some degree. And so you've got to come up with a decision that in the final analysis has a lot of calculations going in it. And the only thing I can say is women are deciding differently than men. And that's because women understand that it does matter if grandma and grandpa have Social Security and Medicare. It does matter if Junior can get a college loan. They, they're more sensitive to the way in which the government intersects with family life um, and nervous about war talk. I mean, it's not for women. It's not about contraception. It's not about abortion. Men and women move together on those things. I'm not saying there's not those issues don't make a ma difference, but they don't make a difference between men and women. But for women who are definitely more pro-democratic and pro-Obama, and their margin of being that is going to determine the election, it's these social policies that matter more. I direct, by the way, a new network called the Scholars Strategy Network. You should check it out on your website, scholarsstrategynetwork.org whose purpose is to recruit university-based scholars to explain complex research in two-page plain English briefs. <laughs> and our current, uh, we have four features each month, and uh, one of our features this month is about women in election 2012, with a whole series of briefs that explain uh, what the gender gap is and isn't, why women voters vote more than men, uh, and what the various issues are that may affect different groups of women in this election. So scholarsstrategynetwork.org, you can get the best scholarship in America in two pages, a shot on everything. Yep. I think money has a tendency to get into politics no matter what. So for me, it's far more important that we've allowed vast amounts of money to accumulate at the top. They'll figure out ways to get it into the political process. And I was in Washington recently and heard Rich Trumka of the AFL-CIO, who hates, of course, that Citizens United decision, but he said one thing it had done was remove the obstacles that kept union members from knocking on doors of non-union people in their neighborhoods. They used to have to go out and only knock on union families' doors. Now they can knock on everybody's door. And I think the answer in politics is always to fight money with large numbers of participating people giving small amounts of money and giving their time and their energy in an organized way. Th that awful decision by the Supreme Court raises the stakes for doing that. But I don't think it's just the money that will determine the outcome. Well, I don't know what he's going to say Thursday night, so I'm going to be watching like everybody else. I hope that he will take the opportunity to do two things. One, to, you know, um, not bombastically, but firmly explain what some of his major accomplishments have been. And I think it's very important to explain the core of the Affordable Care Act. I think Democrats have, not, have run away from that, and they've got to stop. I expect Obama to talk about some of the major parts of that. But he's also got to talk about his vision for the economy, how he is putting together the pieces in his proposals and his accomplishments so that Americans have an idea of where he wants to go that's forward looking. And if he doesn't accomplish that, I think that this election may not go in his favor. I, you know, I mean, ordinary Americans want to hear not just what can you get through Congress next week. I think it's beginning to seep in that <laughs> he hasn't been able to get Congress to do a lot of what he wants. But I think they want to know where he wants to go, and they want to have a sense it makes sense. Uh, so he can't just talk about fairness, can't just talk about women's issues. He's got to talk about how am I going to build an economy that's going to create good jobs and a better future for middle class Americans and for people trying to get into the middle class. I hope he does that. I think he will. The other big speech that really matters is Bill Clinton. And, you know, because Bill Clinton uh, has the ability to talk to middle Americans uh, in living in the middle of the country 
and he, they and his testimony matters to them. So uh, Bill Clinton needs to knock that welfare thing out of the park. He just needs to. Uh, and he also needs to explain, as he's briefly doing in some pro-Obama ads, why sticking with this president's plan. That's the theme. Obama said today he had an incomplete on the economy. They're not going to try to say it's all accomplished, and they shouldn't. Um, we got to stick with this plan. And I, you know, look, they're, they're, they're doing better than I thought they were going to. I mean, in terms of putting together a campaign in this situation to make a strong case, and it really matters that they carry that forward. They can't just bash um, Romney. Uh, and notice that they've been ruthless in going after Romney. But they can't carry that all the way to the election. And I do think they know that. I, I, that's not to say that Biden won't carry it and surrogates won't carry it and the issue of Bain will keep coming up. But that can't be the whole thing because if you're gonna if you're gonna get the idea out there that this is a choice election, which they have done, then you've got to outline the choice. So that's what I'm looking for. I don't know whether it'll be there. <laughs>